Now let's delve into the art of digital storytelling and learn how to turn our ideas into impactful narratives. So I would love to introduce the lovely Barak Bukusi. Um, so he will, he's leading us through this enlightened session. He's the founder of Catapult Agency. He's an experienced content creator and digital storytelling expert with his extensive background in uh, sports um, and, and narratives. Barak is a perfect guide to help us explore the art of digital storytelling. So without further ado, I'd like to embark on this journey and uh, introduce Barak. So Barak, stage is yours. Uh, thank you. Um, thanks, Aina. Thanks, thanks for the, the lovely introduction. I'm hoping everybody can hear me. And yes, I'm, I'm excited to be here. I'm thrilled to be here to talk about, I guess, my journey and what I've learned in digital storytelling um, so far. As um, has been mentioned, I founded an agency about um, seven years ago now. So I've been in the digital entertainment space for about that that long. And the first thing that I was told to do actually was to sort of give a bit of um, an introduction about myself and talk about how and why I got involved into this space. I'm actually um, a lawyer by training. I'm an advocate of the high court. Um, I, I was in law school between 2010 to 2014. I then went to the Kenya School of Law. I graduated. I, I finished that as well. So I have that diploma. And so many people ask me how I then sort of ventured into here. So I'm going to try and do a quick um, three slide presentation on how I got into this space. I hope that you can see my screen. Yeah, I I assume if you can't see my screen, yes. please just um, uh, make a comment or just raise your hand and, and, and I'll try and address it. But if, I assume that you can, so I'll just continue. So my first, I guess if if, if you watch um, superhero movies, this would be my origin story. Um, my, my first interaction into the entertainment space was um, with a series called Entourage. I don't know if any of you have ever heard of it or know about it. It's uh, I think it it spanned for about eight seasons, and Entourage is basically a series about this Hollywood superstar um, who has a manager, who has an agent, and it's essentially around his life and the things that um they had to go through um in Hollywood Hollywood in order to to get jobs and things like that. And I found he had a manager called Eric and an agent called Ari Gold, and I found what. Ari Gold and, and Eric did really fascinating because these were the people who were essentially shaping up um, his career, who are looking for brand deals and brand endorsements and trying to figure out how to monetize um, this superstar. And, you know, so, so through that, I found that really intriguing. But at the time, I hadn't made a conscious decision to sort of get into this space. I was still on my, my, my law degree and my law journey at that point. And then... Soon thereafter, um, this is a picture that um, if you look, uh, I guess, on the right of the screen, this is a picture from 2014. That's me and my best friend. Um, his name is Luis. And we were in Glasgow at the time. Um, and we have had the privilege of going for the Glasgow Commonwealth Games. This was in 2014. And this was when I made the deliberate decision to sort of get into the sports and entertainment space. And what I, what I, what I have there at the bottom of the caption, which essentially says that Everybody who had a ticket to any event at the Commonwealth Games was able to access um, transport for free, was able to move up and down as they would have liked. And that's the first thing that I found extremely fascinating about the structure of the Commonwealth Games, because there were so many people. But the fact that they'd been able to put a couple of towns together and had the infrastructure where anyone who had a ticket for, and I think there were hundreds of events going on, but anyone who had a ticket could be able to get on any bus, any train ride. And just that, the infrastructure to have that together really fascinated me because obviously coming from Kenya at the time, we hadn't had anything of, 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 that, of, of that sort. I think the biggest event I had attended at the time was Safari Sevens, which was a couple couple thousand people at the, at the most, but nothing to this scale because we were in a stadium, this picture, when this picture was taken, we were in a stadium with about 110,000 people. The atmosphere was amazing. And that's really when I made the decision. And I was like, okay, I really want to understand um, how this, this world works and what happens there. And the next slide that I have is actually more of, um, I guess, the economic viability of what the, the, the Commonwealth did for Scotland and Glasgow at the time. So what I've talked about so far was just my own personal 
um, feeling and bias because I just enjoyed myself so much. I said, I need to be able to take this, something like this back home and make people feel the way that I felt when I was in that stadium. So, but if you look at the economic viability and just what the Commonwealth Games did for Scotland and Glasgow as a whole, there was lots of revenue that was pumped into the economy. This was through the eight-year cycle of bidding for the bidding for the games, winning the games, and then preparing the city and the town for the games. I remember at the time, um, so Scotland has two big cities, Glasgow and Edinburgh. The games were in Glasgow, but by the time we were booking our tickets, Glasgow was completely full. And this was maybe three months to, to the event. And so we had to actually book accommodations in a, a different town in Edinburgh because everywhere was completely packed. So just the tourism and just the pure... Um, um, economic value of having an event like this was huge. And as you can see, I've highlighted there just three key points um, going from employment that it offered over a period of, of, of eight years from just the revenue that was um, that was brought in from the tourists on the during the period of the event and just what it did for the economy as a whole. So this for me was really my origin story and why I wanted to then delve into the entertainment um, and creative space because I wanted to be able to do something like this and bring something like this back home and understand how this happened. So from here, I then go on and study, um, I'm doing a master's in sports management, which has essentially helped me understand the technicalities of what goes behind setting up um, something like this. At the same time, actually, um, I, when actually I started Catapult, and so when I started Catapult, I was a rugby player at the time. And so I started representing athletes back home, and essentially, that's my origin story. So I, I hope that gives um, sufficient context into how I got into this space. If anyone has any questions about this particular experience, please ask and I will respond. But I'll stop sharing my screen now so that we can move on to the next part of this presentation. But I'm happy to take any questions that you may have, anyone may have about this particular period in my life. Yeah. Wow, that is such an amazing backstory. Yeah. So much passion filled there. Great. Um, so let's jump in. Um, so the first thing is, could you start by sharing your journey and what inspired you to focus on commercialization and globalization of sports and entertainment entities with Africa? Yeah. So, so basically, what uh, having talked about the my experience in in Glasgow and what I'd experienced, it was really wanting to bring the same back home because I hadn't um, I hadn't experienced anything like it back home. What I had done, like I said, was Safari 7s, or what I experienced was Safari 7s, and I had the privilege as well of participating in the secretariat and the sort of committee councils for setting Safari 7s up, but it was nothing on that scale. I mean, we're talking, like you saw in this presentation, you're talking about over half a million people who showed up. The, the, the environment was amazing. And then more importantly, they were able to figure out the money element. They were able to generate revenue, which was a big thing that, which, which still is a big thing and a big challenge for the industry here, where there's a lot of entertainment, but the monetization element isn't quite understood. So that's really what um, got me really interested and plugged into wanting to, to get into this space. Great, great, okay. Um, so second question, could you share your insights on why storytelling has become such a crucial element in today's content marketing landscape? So I think I, I think storytelling is 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 crucial. And I wouldn't even say that um it's become crucial. I think it always was crucial and always is, because if you go down to the fundamental element of what content creation is or what we do on on Instagram or TikTok or YouTube or um, even on the linear platforms and traditional media, at the end of the day, we're telling stories. We are finding narratives that are important to our audiences, trying to get them to be able to understand something or trying to get them to relate to something. And the easiest way to communicate that is via stories. So I think the element, like the specific element of storytelling has always been important. It's just that medium that has shifted and, and, and now we're working on digital platforms and now there's different apps coming, you know, coming up all together. Now there's threads that's just come up and God knows what else is going to come up. So it's just different ways of being able to communicate, but the story itself is really important. If you look at, again, AR, augmented reality or virtual reality, again, goes back to the same thing. How do you create an environment that's able to, um, that's able to resonate to an audience and it's able to say something to an audience. And the best way to be able to do that is storytelling. If you think about um, the way that, I mean, when, when, when we are growing up as children, the things that parents or grandparents or, you know, different sort of adults, aunties and all of that, the way that they communicate to us is via stories. If you think about all these 
um, children's books, you know, the, the Jack and Jill, the way that they communicate and they understand um, um, different principles via storytelling. Even if you want to go so far as the Bible in the way that Jesus told um, um, his lessons were through parables and again, through multiple stories. So I think storytelling in and of itself has always been a really important element in being able to communicate something and get that across. So I'd argue that it's not it's not become important now, it always was. It's just that I think because of the way stories are told, because of the way we communicate now, it sort of um, accentuates just how important the element of storytelling is in the process of communication right now. I truly agree with that. Um, so when it comes to content creation, what are some key factors that content creators should keep in mind to ensure their stories resonate with their target audience? Ah, uh, yeah. Um, I think, I think here there's, 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 I want to say sort of levels to this. And the reason why I'm saying levels to is it because it depends on whether you're, you're just starting, if you're just beginning your journey as a content creator, meaning that you don't necessarily understand your audience, you may not even have an audience. And so for that, so I'll, I'll speak, I guess, in different categories, and I'll start with that one. So with that, it's really more about, um, beginning to understand, beginning to, to create, at that point, it's really more about testing, you know, it's, it's really about content creation, getting into the cycle of being able to create content, about being able to find things that resonate with other people, before you really can begin to understand who your core audience is, or who a potential core audience is. So at that point, I would say, if you're just starting out, the important thing is really just, uh, is really just to test and just to create. If you already have an audience, or if you've already built an audience, then now, it's a bit more important to take that audience into consideration. So when you're creating content, you need to think about um, what is it that you've already been telling your audience that is of importance and what is it that they actually enjoy. So once you take, after you take your audience into consideration, you then have to define clear objectives. And I'm going to talk about this in not single content pieces, but over um, a month, for example. So if you're a content creator and you have um, your content calendar and you know that the kind of content you're going to produce over a month it's about determining what are your objectives what is it that you'd like to achieve what whether it's um whether it's a growth objective whether it's a relation objective what exactly is that you want to achieve with your audience over this particular month once you then determine what your objectives are and curate and tailor your your, your content to your audience then you know how sort of you're gonna you're, you're gonna create the content and how you're gonna pre provide value. Then there's then the element of um of uh, of creativity and just being the, the fundamental element of being a content creator, which at the end of the day is about being able to entertain your audience, being able to tell a story in a way that makes sense for them, in a way that entertains them and gets a message across. So I think that's another key um factor that you need to be able to consider um, when you're creating content. So it's not just about um you know, moving, a, a, you know, if you're taking a video of, of a cup, and this is where like things like transitions really come in, because it's how do you tell this story or how do you get this content told in the most creative way possible to be able to entertain and get the message across. So I think that's another element that you really need to, um, you really need to, need to consider. Then of course, as the, as, 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 you know, social media has gotten bigger and things like that, there's the element of authenticity that comes in. And I think this is really just based on the fact that there's a lot of replication in this space um a lot of replication in this content creation space so trying to be authentic and yes it's good to you know there's this trendy stuff that people do and you know sometimes it's a trendy song or a trendy dance or whatever the case is and you want to be able to ride the wave but that's not a sustainable way of being able to grow and being able to generate your audience so an authenticity element is also important and then of course i'd say um using whatever data insights you get because all of these platforms give you back data about your audience give you back data about your content they'll tell you what performed well why it performed well if you're doing long form content stuff that's on youtube you know you can go and check the most watched parts um and then be like okay so this is what my audience really likes to hear can i be able to create more more content like this. So again, using the data and the insight that you get from different platforms to be able to help you create the next piece of content, I think is really important. Um, yeah, and I think, you know, if you just loop that in, um, with those those different stages, then I think, yeah, you should be able to, 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 to use specific tools to be able to create really good content. Great, okay. It seems we have some questions um, yeah. from our lovely attendees. I think uh, the first one is, do you do mentoring, especially on event management in the sports arena? I'm trying to read the host. I can I can read the, the person who asked the question once you're done. 
Okay. Oh, it's um, a, sorry. It's a chaka masi. Chakava masi. Okay. Do I do do I do mentoring personally? No, I have not started doing any mentoring, but we are in the process um, with ADMI, we are in the process of developing a new course under um, sports, um, sports management, event management, and um, uh, entertainment management. So this will actually be, I'm in the process of finalizing the development of a course that will be offered at diploma level and certificate level at um, ADMI. So I guess technically I will be there as a mentor in one way or another. Um, yes, I hope that answers your question. I hope so too. Um, also, second question is, how is the field uh, in terms of content creation sustainable? Sorry, how is the field in terms of sustainability into the foreseeable future? Don't okay. Yeah. Content creation. Okay, I, I think I understand it to some extent. I'll, I'll give you my opinion. Of course, it's, it's just an opinion. It's not fact. It's not, um, um, so don't quote me per se. But my um, in terms of sustainability into the future, I think the skills are going to change rapidly. Um, if you're if if you're looking at so I'll give an example when I started content creation or working in the content creation space in 2014, I knew you know on the sort of like my two hands I could have all the um, content creators who had above a hundred thousand or two hundred thousand followers. I either knew them or I knew how to get to them. But now, um, every other day, someone sends me a link to someone who I have never ever seen, I've never had, ever heard of, and they have over half a million um, uh, followers, and they have a community already. So the content creation space has rapidly grown in terms of the entrance into the market at the content creation level. So there's um, there's, there's just way too many people there to keep sort of try and keep track of. So I think it's going to be really important to find uniqueness, your unique selling point. And what makes you stand out from the rest? Because I can even tell you in the monetize on the on the on the money element of things, between a hundred thousand and probably three hundred to four hundred thousand followers, in terms of how much money you can charge, there's very little difference. Um, there's not much there's not much more you can add on your rate card when you're sort of within those levels. It's really over the five hundred thousand or over the million mark where you're really beginning to um change your rate card rapidly. So at that point, there's not much different from a monetizable point of view. If you're looking, however, at just the skills, so you need to be able to be um, quite unique. You need to be able to find out how you're going to stand out from the rest. And then what then I'll also say is artificial intelligence, AI, is also going to change this, um, uh, bring yet another disruption element into this space, where now, um, you know, based on AI tools, you can be able to get content generated without a content creator, without an influencer. So that's also going to change the space because the question then now becomes, um, what then becomes the important skill to have? Is it to be able to use AI tools? Because I mean, if, if you know things about deep fake and things like that, it's literally having your um, likeness, um, being able to be licensed to different tools and they can use it. So does it then mean that content creators will be li um, um, licensing their likeness in different spaces and having those elements used? Does it then mean that the most powerful person in the content creation value chain is then the person who can understand AI and who knows how to use AI? Because if I can, if I can, if I can create, so for example, if I was to run an experiment, if I can create a social media page or an influencer purely based off of AI and no, no, no physical or real time interaction, but I'm still getting good engagement, then it's going to cost me a lot less than a content creator who's actually moving to different spaces to take pictures. And I'll have a, I'll have I'll be basically be able to create a lot more content a lot quicker among many other things. So in terms of the future, there's a lot of things to take into consideration of what's potentially going to happen. And of course, with regard to AI, um, depending on the regulation that comes into place, um, whether it's on this particular platforms or whether it's within specific um, regions and governments, there's a lot that's going to determine how that's going to work there. But um, in terms of the future, I think I think there's there's a bright future, but there are some skills that definitely need to be picked up, and content creators will need to add to their skill set already to be able to survive and thrive in the future. In my opinion. Great. Okay. Yeah. Um, so third question, they're really coming in. Uh, how do you monetize your content? Um, how do I monetize my content? So I, I maybe I think this this also precedes a couple of questions lower down in 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 the presentation that we have or the questions that I've I've been given to talk about. But I guess I will answer. 
uh, monetizing your content basically goes down to um, what is the business model that you want to work with. Um, and what I mean by that is, so first, okay, actually, first of all, let me let me say this. The first thing in determining or monetizing your content is having a deliberate strategy to monetize your content. So what happens many times is, at least in my experience or what I've seen, content creators will just create content and do a lot of it for the good of it. And which is why a lot of, in a lot of um, spaces, it's still considered, the entertainment space is still considered a hobby because if you're creating, um, um, I have an Instagram page and I'm not particularly, a, I don't categorize myself as a content creator, but I can create content. So a lot of people assume then it must be easy to create content because just taking a picture and posting, but it really isn't. It's a whole other um, um, scope. So the first thing that I would say is you need to have a deliberate strategy on how you're going to monetize your content. And then now once you do that, you then have to consider different uh, business models of how it's going to work. So a lot of the people, and I'd say 90 99% of people use the ad business, um, ad revenue model. And ad revenue model basically means that you're going to create content and you're going to create opportunities for brands and companies to come and advertise on your space. So, and this is what a lot of people do, whether it's linear, linear platforms. So if you think about like a TV station or a radio station, again, majority of the revenue model comes from advertising. So um, if you think about any content creator, um, who's making money, a lot of their revenue is coming from advertising. So Safaricom comes and pays you and they say, can you create this content and do this for me and do that for me? And so I'll do that. So that's the ad revenue model. You can then, there are other revenue models that are also open for people to be able to consider whether you want to use um, um, ticket sales. So for example, if you look at what... Um, Jugush did with, or Jugush has done over the last four years with TTNT4, or if you look at what Abdel's doing right now, or if you look at what the Joy Red podcast has also done a couple of times, or TMI podcast as well have done that, essentially what we mean by that is you're creating content and then at some point be able to have an event or have something which will require um, the, your audience to pay money to be able to come and either enjoy the content or watch the content. So that's then we're going to um, ticket sales and you consider that as a specific piece of revenue. Then there's other elements that come in. So here you can then talk about um, things like licensing once you become big enough. So if you think about any huge um, creator, um, think about, for example, like someone like Nashinsky and Nashinsky, what he's doing with um, Johnny Walker or te Techno. And, you know, interestingly, he's, he's, he's in a court matter with techno at the moment but my point is once you become big enough you're then able to license your image and license your, your your persona to be able to generate revenue from that so that again is another um element of being able to monetize your content so essentially the thing about monetizing your content is the content is just the inroad it's just where you you enter the sort of space from and then from there then try and strategize and try and figure out okay how can i then use the the people that i have been able to gather and generate and create content generate money and revenues from this via different ways uh, i hope that also answers your question um chakava chakava masi yes uh so I'll ask the last question then we can go to the next um question to you and then yeah. we'll still keep answering them Sure. Um, what are the challenges you go through in the industry? Um, the challenges that I go through in the industry, um, <laughs> there, there are quite a few. Um, maybe I'll just name I'll just name like one or two. The first thing that I'd say is um the lack of um lack of um structure and um infrastructure, let me say. Um lack of infrastructure. Why what I mean by this is in more developed economies or in economies that have more developed systems, it's a lot easier to get um to 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 grow your markets and have and have sort of systems work for you. So for example, if I'm to give you there's a there's a, a rapper, I'm forgetting his name. Um I hopefully I remember his name in, in, in the context of this conversation. But he was um before he launched his album in the States, he did a tour to each of the, I believe there are 51 states in, in America, drove drove to each and every one of them and performed at each um at a club in each city. And I know they, who you're talking about. I'm actually trying to remember. <laughs> yeah, I forgot his name. Yeah. He's, a, he's a white rapper. I forgot his name. But the year after, he then um, launched his album and released his album. And what, why he did what he did is so that he wanted to make sure when he launches his album, he has at least a fan base in each city in the state, which means that he'd be able to distribute his money, he distribute his music and make money from each state. Now, if you bring that into a Kenyan context, the amount of money that it'll cost you to be able to go to, for example, every town in Kenya to be able to perform, to be able to create a substantial fan base 
is quite a bit. It'll cost you quite a bit of money. So if you start looking at things like purely um, the transport infrastructure, I've had this conversation with multiple people from people who've done tours before to people who are event specialists and asking them, you know, is it sustainable to do a tour in Kenya? And a lot of them, unfortunately, comes back to no, because the costs of just being able to make it happen are just so high. So when you come to growth and being able to um, being able to grow your fan base, because your fan base is where you're going to be able to generate money, that becomes a bit of a challenge because you're not able to. And what I've learned in the few, I guess, touring in different counties that I've done is you'll find that what people pay attention pay attention to in Nairobi isn't what people are going to pay attention to in Nakuru or Mombasa. And so in the entertainment space, unless you're actively pursuing and going into those spaces, you won't understand what they enjoy, what they like. And that, of course, is a challenge because it's going to limit the growth of your fan base. So I'd say infrastructure is one. Two, I'd say is um, just the revenue. So what I mean by that is we still don't, we still have a very, very young industry, right? Uh, and I'll give an example of, uh, I guess, my own career. If I was in the States or if I was in the UK and the job that I do, I'd be working in a talent management agency and I would be doing um, the kind of deals that I would be negotiating or working on would be movie deals, would be license endorsements. It would be conversations with Adidas and Nike and the likes. Um, because that's the level at which the industry is in. But I yeah, bring that um that same sort of qualification and I come to the Kenyan context, but the conversations then that I'm having are very different because I'm talking to brands about brand de brand deals. We are not at the level where we have a bad, a big enough um um movie space. It's growing, but it hasn't gotten there yet, where there's enough conversations to go around um talking about movie deals and things like that. So that again is a limitation where the, the money still isn't that big. And then even if I look at specifically the content creation space, like I said at the beginning, I would I, I probably would know everyone who had a decent following, but right now I don't. And the problem is that side, in terms of the content creation side, has had a huge influx. And there's so many people who've come into this space, but it hasn't resonated on the other on the other money side. So the money side hasn't moved much from 20. Um, 2017. What I can say is that, yes, they're giving out money a little easier, but in terms of the amount of money, it hasn't increased rapidly. So that, again, is, is, is a challenge. So people still don't really appreciate the value that they get on, on, on the digital and the content creation side of things. So those are two challenges that I, I would give you right now. Great. Yeah. I would add and even say, you know, at this day and age, it's still... We're still not taken, other content creation uh, industry is still not taken with as much seriousness as other businesses. So it's slowly getting there, but slowly, hopefully, but surely. Okay, yeah. so we jump to the next question. Um, how do you see collaboration between different roles? So for writers, designers, marketers, contributing mm -hmm. to the success of a digital storytelling project? Um. Yeah, so what 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 I'd say is um I think there's a space for all of these all of these um all these people to work and 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 work together and collaborate and create something that's amazing. What I have learned in my space is of, of course when you start out, um when you start out, you sort of have to do everything on your own. You have to sort of pick up a couple of skills because you may not have the money to hire. Um, um, you may not have the money to hire a graphic designer. Or you may not have the money to to hire like a full team to be able to really help you to execute. So you have to sort of pick up the skills um yourself and sort of at an entry level. But if you are able to, or if you get to the point where you're able to bring in these different skill sets, then I think it 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 exponentially increases your abilities, um, um, your 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 probability of success and the value of the work that you bring. Because what I have learned is, um, for example, like a uh, graphic designers, um, I'd say in my opinion, they they have the ability to see certain things that, for example, for me, I just don't see, and they're able to bring certain visions to life in a way that I genuinely couldn't, and they really are able to. Um, entice, enhance, and make your audience feel a particular kind of way around whatever whatever project or whatever piece of work you're putting out. So I'd say that there's a lot of space for collaboration. I do think it is important. When you watch any, for example, if you watch any movie, I mean, at the end of the movie, you have credits from here to, you know, the end of, of, of the world. You know, there's lots and lots of people who participate in very many things, you know, from costume designers to, you know, assistant costume designers to music oh. producers. You know, also like there's such a large scope and so much space for people to be able to work and excel in this space that I think 
that in terms of collaboration, yes, it is important. It is also expensive. I must also bring that in. And when I say expensive, I don't mean someone's going to charge you 100000 per se. But what I do mean is you have to have the money to pay them. So either, either you're paying them or you're giving them equity in whatever project that you're, 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 you're working on. And hopefully when it does generate money, you're able to work. I know at the very beginning of um, my content um, space or my um, journey in the entrepreneurship, uh, in, the, in the content entertainment space, there was a lot of that, which was essentially working with people and saying, look, can we work together on this project? I don't have the money to pay you, but when it comes good, <laughs> then we can do the revenues. I know that was a way that we we worked around a lot of things. I um, mean, just being able to create good things and move that forward. So that was my response to that. Yeah. Okay. I would say, yeah, I, I completely understand your perspective. I think it's it's interesting to understand, you know, at the beginning, you kind of need to learn how to work, how to write, how to do some basic graphics, right? Just to grasp um, the idea of how to run your own company. But yeah. also I've found in the industry that some people are a bit, you know, strange when they kind of want to do the whole job, but it's a bit on the next level. So yeah. it is almost easier to just invite people with the actual skill set and split the profit. So if you're planning to get paid, say 100K, you want to take the whole 100K, you can just take maybe 20, garner some, you know, at least a project under your belt and get to pay everyone else an equal amount of share of what they've done. Yeah. Yeah, great. Okay. Um, so I'll go to the next. Uh, there's a few questions for you. Okay. Um, so the first one is, I know creativity has really reduced with our artists. Now it's copy-paste. The content churned out has no positive cultural value. How can this be addressed? This is a this is a question from Catherine Masharia. So, oh, sorry. Could you please repeat the question? I, I, sure, I can sure. see this chat. So I'm, I was trying to read it. Yeah, I note creativity has really reduced with our artists. Now it's copy paste. Shame. Uh, the content churned out has no positive cultural value. How can this be addressed? Um, I don't know. I don't know about. Um, I, okay, I, I'm not sure what you mean by addressed, and and I don't know if you mean addressed like from a societal point of view, or addressed in the sense of how can we get people to create um better better content. So in terms of a societal point of view, I don't I don't think it's possible. And why I say that is because of course it's a free economy. Anyone can do whatever it is that they want. And remember, um, the the public only respond to what the audience response to or the content creators create what the audience responds to for example if i created if even if if, if i was copying you let's say we we're both content creators and i'm copying you but my audience is liking it they're engaging <laughs> with it i'm able to continue to build i mean uh, why would i need to change because my audience is responding the analytics is telling me what i'm doing is working i don't need to think too creatively or too hard over it but so i'll continue to do the same so from my from my um perspective is i don't see a reason to change because according to the metrics of my measurement um and, and how i want to perceive my career everything is working so that's not going to change because i have no reason for it to change on the second element of how do you get people to to, to begin to create um, things with a little more substance and things that are a lot more creative and not copy paste. I think there now you're stuck between what now you call the uh, true creatives and I guess what you're saying in terms of copy pasting, because the truth of the matter is not everybody who says they are a creative or a content creator actually are, um, because their ability to think up new concepts, think up new ways of being able to express certain things isn't easy. Um, when you look at these shows, for example, if I'm to talk about a show, if you look at any show that has, I know, I know these days shows don't go for very many seasons, but if you look at something like Modern Family, which was, I think, across 13 seasons and 22 episodes a season, it takes an enormous amount of writers to be able to bring that together, to be able to tell that many stories. It takes a lot of you people having, to, and that's why people see them break them seasons have breaks, because you need some time to just take a second, reflect, rethink, get new ideas and get that creativity going again. Because creativity isn't, I, I wouldn't say it's simple. It isn't simple. Um, um, think about anyone, even if you want to think about someone like Ed Sheeran, for example. Again, he takes massive breaks off of his albums or just the process of being able to create something new. Think about Adele again, the time span between the albums that she releases. It takes, even if you think about Saudi Soul, Saudi Soul are now on their, I believe they're doing their fifth album now, if I'm not wrong. And they've been in this space for, what, um, 10 years? So 
even in any in any space, creativity takes time, creativity takes work, and and it's it's essentially not simple. So in terms of what it would take for people to be able to tell better stories and be more creative, I'd say one is yeah, to take to take a lot more breaks and just to try and think and find inspiration from different spaces. I read, I watched this documentary on uh, Coldplay once where they were talking about the fact that every time they would finish an album tour, the artist would take a break and each of them would go and try to learn a new um, instrument. So when they come back together, they have a different perspective of right. a new perspective of how they're going to um, approach something and how they're going to approach the new album. So those are, I guess, certain things that people employ in the creative space to try and be more creative. But it's, yeah, it basically bottles down for me to the fact that creativity is a tool that, in my opinion, isn't that common. So there's actually very, very few people who have the ability to genuinely be creative. And then a lot of us then, you know, replicate and, 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 and you know, I guess we're still able to generate a living off of that. Fantastic. Yeah. I would also just add on that, you know, in this day and age, everyone is online <laughs> as opposed to before. So we just got a few people, you know, being able to show showcase their work. And now everyone with a smartphone can decide to do this. And so only the best really get the most views. But there's also that that kind of has diluted the amount of um, creativity that you see online. Great, yeah. Catherine Masharia, I hope we answered your question. Um, I'll go to the next question. Um, so this is from Riziki Bakari. And his question is, how does one maintain consistency in content creation, especially if you're just starting out? Yeah. Um... So my uh, my answer to that is, is really simple. Um, and I say it's simple, but it's not easy. Um, and it boils back down to discipline. It boils back down to discipline because like you have, as you have rightly pointed out, consistency is really the way to build a community. Consistency is really the way to really, I think, really do anything in the content creation space. So the discipline to be able to actually create content, the discipline to be able to actually follow your, your content calendar or your strategy, the discipline to actually see it through. Because what also happens for a lot of creatives, and, and it's a lot of creatives all over the world, is they're very emotive and very in their feelings um, and kind of people. So, you know, um, they will create when they feel like creating and when they don't feel like creating, they will not create. And I think that's the 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 place where you get stuck very very quickly because you just need to be able to create content so you just need and and, and honestly they I don't think there's a secret sauce to it in terms of how do you get over the the how how do you get over the consistency I don't think there's a secret sauce I think there are different um tips and tricks that you know you can use so for example if you go and look up a person called James Clear um on um on YouTube TikTok um Twitter whatever it is he has a newsletter called the one two three newsletter but he talks a lot about self improvement and just how to keep going so one of the things that he says is you know if you if you if you create a certain routine then try and not miss two days in a row. So it means that if if you're supposed to be creating content all week and I miss today, then I need to ensure that at least tomorrow I don't miss. And then he he's he's um his rule is also on 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 a one percent and continuous improvement. So rather than looking at like a huge goal and something that you're really trying to achieve far away, but just try to be better tomorrow. Whatever it is that you're doing, try to be better tomorrow and ensure that you don't fall back. So there's different I think tips and tricks that you can try and find. Based on, I mean, there's another girl also called Sahil Bloom on Twitter who talks again a lot about self-improvement and things like that. Those are resources and people you can look to and see because th this isn't, um, it isn't limited to, to, to content creation. This, I think, is across the board in any, um, any workspace that you'd be in, just around self-improvement and how to keep it consistency. And I think it's even more difficult for content creation or this creative economy because many times we are our own bosses. So and, and and like a place where you be in employment, where you are required to be there from eight to five or nine to five, Monday to Friday. So you're going to work depending on whatever it is you're feeling in the content creation space where you're your own boss. If you don't feel like doing something, a lot of the times you may not actually do it. So you have to build in the capability and the capacity to have discipline to just keep going. That's the... That's what I would say to, to, to that question in terms of how do you build the consistency. And unfortunately, Rizeki, there's just no there's just no shortcut to that one in terms of being able to build the capacity to have this um, um consistency. Hundred percent agreed. And and that cuts across just anything you're trying to do in life, right? Um 
Okay, cool. So we'll go to the next question by, um, hold on, by uh, Vivian, Vivian Maguero. Okay. So Vivian says, I work in the nonprofit sector and interested in storytelling for the community grassroots projects we work with for our organizations to be sustainable and can generate money for from some of the projects they do. How do we create content that is attractive given the purpose of the grassroots organization is a bit different from the usual industries or brands that generate more fan base and revenue? E.g., we focus on climate change activism. Um, interesting. I was in a panel a discussion, I think, two weeks ago, again, that this question sort of was addressed and came up. And I think for that, my response, uh, I'll copy from, from what was said at that panel and what I also said is, I think in specifically looking at nonprofit sectors and people who work in, I guess, uh, areas where it's really about privilege and really about trying to, whether it's, it's raise funds or make people care about a specific, um, um, specific thing, it boils back down to how do you tell the most interesting stories that you have? I think, unfortunately, very many, um, very many, uh, uh, what do you call it? Uh, organization NGOs in this particular in these departments keep telling the same story, and what then happens is at some point the audience then has apathy to such things because, um, unfortunately, we do want to have positivity in our lives. We do want to have joy. Yes, we live in a big bad world, and lot lots of things are happening and going wrong. But we we don't want to be um reminded of it every single time. So I think the question is, how do you get your audience to understand a message? without repeatedly um, making them feel like, so for example, you've talked about um, um, climate change and, and, and change activism. How do you make me care about climate change and activism? How do you tell a story that's relevant to me? That's just a good story. If I'm to use an example of, um, uh, uh, for me, it's more about trying to take the the, the philosophy of what I'm gonna talk about than what I'm actually talking about is Christian music. So a lot of times, Christian music is listened to because it's Christian music. Because we, if if you if you subscribe to the Christian faith and you want to worship God, you sing Christian music and you listen and you know you listen to Christian music. But many times, at least before these people like Maverick and um, Elevation and all these other sort of um, um, worship worship um, uh, teams and companies that have record labels that have come up in the last two three years, a lot of that we would just listen to the music because it's Christian music. But I'd say two, three years ago, I think, especially in the state, that sort of changed, where now they're just trying to produce good music. So it's good music that, whether it is Christian or not, it's music that anyone can actually listen to, enjoy, and pay attention to. So I'd say I'd want to apply the same philosophy to to this, to this sort of NGO world or nonprofit sector, where I'm saying, how do you just create a good story? How do you just create good content that people will not listen to or pay attention because you're trying to appeal to, I guess, a way narrative and, you know, support support me and support us. And it's important because it's going to be good for your kids and, you know, we're not going to destroy the planet. But how do you just tell a good story that people can pay attention to? Um, there's a campaign that um, um, they talked about at this panel, which was, I believe, a, a, an AIDS AIDS awareness campaign by I think a company called Red and they partnered with a lot of um at the time unique um products they did something with Nike with iPhone and with multiple different people where I guess if you purchased a specific type of um, they, they developed like this specific type of red color on each of these different products and if you purchase that product you then donated a, a, a few um a few I think it was dollars or pounds to the organization and they were able to raise I want to say a couple million, if not a couple billion. So I think also wow. the element of, of trying to I'll find the I'll try to find the, the campaign and send it in the link. But if you try and um and, and just try and find the most exciting narratives and the best stories that you can tell, um, then I think you begin to move in the right direction. Fantastic answer. I hope um that answers your question, Vivian. So we'll jump into the next question by uh, Melvin. Glima, Glima, yeah. So Melvin says, I create content for dentists. There are too many cookie cutter stories circulating out there. Additionally, one dentist seems to be selling herself and her work on the back of indigenous food recipes. Dear, uh, your take on this method, what's your take on this method and what else should we be trying to do to reach an audience who wants all their senses stimulated with your dental content? 
Just let me just, would you repeat the question? Just Sure, sure, no worries. Um, so Melvin says, or asks rather, I create content for dentists. Mm -hmm. There are too many cookie cutter stories circulating out there. Mm -hmm. Additionally, one dentist seems to be selling herself and her work on the back of indigenous food recipes. Um, your take, what's your take on this method? And what else should we be trying to do to reach an audience who wants all their senses stimulated with your dental content? So, uh, okay, I, I don't know if Melvin, you're able to expound. I'd want to understand um, how is she selling her work on the back of indigenous <laughs> recipes? How, how exactly does that work? I'm not sure I, I fully understand um, that bit. Um, then I can be able to expound because that's what I'm trying to I'm trying to um, sort of yeah understand. Or or I don't if Celine, if you, if you understand it you could maybe break it down to me. Um, I am also not very sure exactly what he means. Maybe he can just uh, Melvin kindly if you can expound and then we'll get back to you and we can right. jump on the next question. Okay. Um, so Rachel Otin asks, how do mm. you tell stories of a quite rigid entity, i.e service industry that has a lot of reservation and marketing and publicity, for example, audit, an audit firm or audit company. Okay. Um, again, I think here it, 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 it boils back down to one, understanding your audience, understanding what your audience needs are, understanding what your audience, um, what your audience wants are. So, and I'd say content here can be used for, for multiple things. There's the general awareness, which is just making, making as many people as possible aware of the fact that you exist. There's then the engagement of your community, the people who are already engaged with you. How do you create content that makes sense for them on a regular basis that they can pay attention to? And that maybe is where you're falling into the space of, um, uh, uh, I guess, a rigid, a rigid space. And I think, to be honest, I think also, if if it's if you're in employment and this is an organization that you work for, I think then the management understanding is also important because what I've also found in my work is a lot of people who are who are still the decision makers still don't really understand how content will work for the organization. So I think sometimes it's around trying to have a, a proof of concept, being able to do something small that can at least prove your concept that will allow the organization or the decision makers to allow you to do this at a bigger scale. So I think one, that's one element that comes in that's really important. But in terms of being able to just find stories that matter, it's, it, it, it boils back down to your audience. So for example, if you have a really small um, niche, let's say you're in, I'm trying to think of like a really niche um market let's say quantity quantity surveying for example let's say quantity surveying has a very for the purpose of this example has a very small market let's say you have i don't know 10,000 quantity survey surveyors in the in the country and you already have a database or you already have a followership or customer base for about 9,500 people there's only so much more that you can grow with there's only 500 people who you have not reached so you're almost at capacity so if your objective there is still around um growth then of course I, I think you're sort of in the wrong direction because you're almost at capacity. So at that point, it really becomes how do you engage these people more? And in that space, I then say, how do you create um content or create um things that are relevant for your audience in a wider scope? So if you're able to do audience research and understand your audience a bit better, then you'd be able to create multiple products around them that would sort of keep them within this ecosystem that they exist if you think at how if you think about how um apple for example as a company has 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 has, has diversified from macbooks to iphones to ipads to apple music to just creating multiple products for one specific individual so you sort of keep them within that ecosystem so i'd say again for me, looking at content as a starting point, as the entry point of being able to engage with your customer, because at the end of the day, it is a business that I'm assuming that you're running one way or another or that you're a part of. And the, LM, the, the most important thing there is to try and generate revenue. So how do you use content to get into the entry point? And then how do you now think out of the box to be able to make this content or this community that you've built to work better for your customer base? So I'd say that for me is the most um, sort of most important um, thing there. In terms of, of uh, have I touched? Yeah, I think I've addressed everything on that particular question, Rachel. If I haven't, please do let me know. Yeah. Great. Okay, so... We can go to the next question from Lois Ominde. 
When having conversations on storytelling, the focus is majorly B2C. Now, how do creatives in B2B go about storytelling? Uh, I think, again, a little bit of what I said in the earlier um, question sort of matters, and that is management. Um, uh, the people at the management level who are the true decision makers, being able to believe in what you're doing and being able to understand in what you're doing and being able to see that value will come back. So I can tell you, for example, I know the Dayland um, marketing manager um, on a personal level, and I know for a fact that they have collaborated with a number of uh, businesses. They've done one with Java. They've done one with L'Oreal. Um, I think they have, if I'm not wrong, they have some other partnerships that they want to sort of come up. Um, so again, it's about being able to understand what value are you going to be able to create um, for this other company and how does that benefit both of your audiences? Where do your cust where does your customer base intersect and meet? And how do you create content that makes sense for both of you in that sense? So again, first thing is you have to have a proof of, in terms of, for me, on a management perspective, you have to have a, a proof of concept for people to actually believe and understand that this thing or this project or this content that you want to create will have value. And then finding like-minded partners um, where you know there's an intersection between your customer base or the people that you're trying to communicate with ultimately and then experimenting and, and trying that um, and trying that that narrative out again being able to find really interesting storylines that you can draw from each other and yeah and then just testing that out great i hope that answers your question mm -hmm. um so we'll go back to our questions um so digital platforms offer various formats of for content from, vid from videos to articles to interactive elements, how can yeah. creators choose the right format for their storytelling and how does this tie into engaging the audience effectively? Uh, okay, that's a that's a really good question. And to sort of answer that, I'll give a bit of a, a bit of a, a story. Um, and, and again, I'll put the link to this article and just these details in um in the description box that I think you can go and try and find after um if, if you so feel inclined. Um there's a there's a there's a behavioral scientist economist called um Malcolm Gladwell. I believe he wrote the tipping point like among other other um books and he gives a really interesting talk um around this phys this physicist called Howard Maskovitz. Um, who was like a really top tier physicist in the 1970s, and he was um, he was employed by Pepsi to try and find or try and create the perfect Pepsi for a specific audience, right? And the thing that really gives Pepsi its unique taste is a certain level of, of sugar, I guess what they'll call acetate, which needs to be between level eight to twelve. And so he gets this huge um, sample size and tests them. And so he tries to get different people at a different and create they create multiple Pepsis at different levels. So one at eight, 8.1, 8.2, 8.3, 8.4, all the way up to 12. So that's a huge range of sample size. Gets multiple customers to come and try them and then tries to make sense of the data. And so he tries to make sense of the data and he can't he can't make sense of it because the data is all over the place. Um, some people like the, the, the one with more sugar, some people like the one with less sugar. It doesn't even make sense. And um, so what's interesting here is Marco Gladwell says that usually if someone was, if you are the consultant on this project, what you do is you make an average and go back to Pepsi and say, look, so the average is between nine point whatever. So the best thing that you can do is create a Pepsi that's that's within this nine point whatever mark of acetate. But he didn't do that. He sort of wanted to go a, 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 a level higher because he really wanted to understand what would be important, what, what the audience would really like. And he realizes, I guess in... In, in, in a moment of brilliance or whatever you'd want to call it, that there's no perfect Pepsi. And there's no perfect Pepsi because people have different tastes. People just have different tastes. And it's not possible to just come up with something across the board that would be like, this is the perfect drink. So for example, I have a different palette from my wife, from my daughters. We all like different things and taste different things. And so there's not one product that you can come and give to me and say, look, this is the perfect thing. This is where you're going to be able to find me. It would be possible, at least not in my house. So the, the, the philosophy and the thing to take into account here is to understand that there's different people who will consume content in different ways. And that's just, and, and it's the way that they, 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 they do it is the way that they like. So there's no, 
one perfect platform or one perfect place where you're going to meet everybody. It's about understanding where are your different consumers and how can you cluster them up in clusters that make sense, right? So if you can even come up with three or four clusters that make sense of the different types of people that you're trying to talk to, and then from those clusters, then now create... Um, create content in these four different ways that reaches these people. So my answer to that question is there's no one perfect place. It's never going to be there because humans are just that varied. So it's about trying to understand how wide your audience scope is and then try to understand where and how do they want to to, to receive this content and then creating the content in that specific nuanced way. And then you'll be able to reach your different audiences. Agreed. I would, yeah. I would also tell the audience to maybe also just understand how the different platforms work yeah. because, you know, something you might want to post like a reel on, uh, on, on say Instagram, that reel could be, um, could be a really beautiful article on LinkedIn. That's kind of sending the same information, but just different depending on the platform that you're using. Cool. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I can see our audience have asked more questions. So let's check them out. Um, Catherine Masharia asks, I recently learned that brands are always on top, e.g. Coca-Cola, Ferrari, etc., that are always on top, don't sell products, rather they sell emotions and lifestyle. Do you agree? First question. And is this the same with content creation? Second question. Uh, yes, I agree. Um, yes, I agree. Because the, the the size of brands that they are now, um, a brand like Coca Cola. I mean, it's not about awareness. It's not even so much about um driving sales, but it's more about how does how how does it connect with you? How do you feel when you have the product? How do they make you feel a specific kind of way? So that's the 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 point of of marketing or the point of trying to reach you sort of shifts a little. So yes, I do agree. Um, and the next question you asked was how does that relate to um content creation? Um. I would say that I think, again, it boils back down to the size of content creator that you are or why you're trying to create content and the objective and purpose and reason. So, um, and again, I would say, yes, in terms of my earlier response, yes, I do believe that that's where it is. But again, there are different purposes of content, right? So for example, if if you see any content that's driving sales, anything that's driving a promotion of, you know, I remember uh, the previous, um, like previous Coke ads where they'd say, you know, if you look at the, that rubber thing that used to be underneath the bottle caps, you know, you can win something. So of course that's sort of pushing sales to some degree of people being able to purchase the product. So I'd say again, in the content creation space, one depends on what kind of content creator you are, at what size are you? Because again, if you're, if you're, monetization model is based is built on ad revenue then it means that um the brand managers at these organizations need to have you at the top of mind so it means that to some extent you do need to create content that's just going to be good content that people can appreciate that these brand managers when they're sitting in their in their decision making spaces and want to make decisions they're like oh yeah so and so created a really cool reel um, we should use them for this. Or so and so talks to content that resonates to my to my audience. So we should we should we should have it at this. And trying to identify what are the really um important things within the content that you create that will make that um make that connection between the brand managers and where you are. So I'd say that's a really important thing to keep um um to keep in touch of. Yes. Fantastic answer. Um so I'll go to the next question from Wamboy Kangara. She asks, in running an agency, how do you go about your USP so you stand out and acquire the right client and consistent client flow? So the the kind of the kind of agency that I run, um, I think the my USP is built on how my model and how I go about managing and working with content creators and people that I represent. So we have a specific model that we created based on the experience that I had had in the different spaces. So created that. And so that's what we sort of essentially use. And that's how we've created our USB. I don't think there's anyone else who sort of has, who works with representatives in the way that we've worked with. In terms of consistent client flow, again, if you do, there's, there's, the, there's the philosophy, if you build it, they will come. So if you do good work, um, if you do good work, you will get recommended by people um, and you will get the right people who come into your spaces. So I'd say the focus is on the 
the not so much the outcome but the process so making sure that you work and you do your work well and you offer something that is unique and looking at what do people what what in, and then if i'm to talk about the other kinds of agencies where there's the big big marketing and brand agencies it's about looking at what are the what are the bigger or other agencies providing what are they not providing and how can you be the one to provide something in that space so i think that's really important in trying to identify your usp which I think, um, you know, if you can figure that out, and, and this is constantly happening, if you look at the disruption of agencies, because essentially what happens is you have young people who are coming in who are able to offer the same quality of work at a much less price. And that's currently, I think, the method that a lot of young agencies have been using. But now there's different things to and different ways to explore, um, you know, a unique way of going, going about things. I hear there's an agency in in Canada now that has differentiated from the regular agency work because what they've realized is the like the digital content creation a lot of work that agencies charge brands for brands can do that in house so what the agency is now now doing is offering trainings to brands that they work with to help them build capacity to be able to do the things that they do in house and what they then now become is just strategic partners throughout the you know throughout their i guess their strategy 5 year 10 year cycles of strategy so essentially that's a new way of being able to to work as an agency so i'd say it's about thinking and being innovative in in the process and finding what's not out there and if uh, at the end of the day finding a solution for your customer agreed Okay, great. So we'll go to the next question. Um, in the age of information overload, or and we are, <laughs> capturing and maintaining the audience's attention is a challenge. What strategies can creators employ to ensure that their digital stories stand out and leave a lasting impact? Uh, that's a good question. The my my simple answer is the word remarkable. Um and why I say the word remarkable is when you think about the definition of what the word remarkable means, it's literally just worthy of remark. Um, if you think about how um, anything, at least for me, how I make my decisions. For example, if I want to buy a new phone and let's see, uh, let's say I get a, I see a good ad um, about an iPhone, but the ad will sort of get me to a certain place. But what I'll do is I'll talk to my friend who has an iPhone. I'll be like, what is this phone actually like? If it is worthy of remark, then the person will make good remarks about it and they probably will then go and purchase the phone I'm, or purchase the product. If it is not worthy of remark, then you know it's nothing to write home about. I won't see anything and it'll be done. So I'd say even in terms of um, content creation is it needs to be worthy of remark. Now, worthy of remark can go in multiple ways. There's, of course, the, I would say, simpler way that a lot of content creators or a good number of content creators go down, which is a sensational route. And that is essentially having really sensational content um, and by this is, I guess, you know, the reality TV kind of things, like things that may not necessarily be, be, be realistic, but will get people talking and will get you on the tabloids or whatever it is. So there's that route that people also take, which is, I guess, a little simpler, but then that begins to potentially compromise partners that you might be able to work with or may, or, and then again, the problem of going down that route is you may have to be able to be more and more sensational and have to keep creating things to go. Um, there's this uh, Netflix um, untold story that, that that was released, I think, last two weeks ago by um, Jake Paul. Um, that would be a good thing to go and watch in that sense, because he talks about how they had gone down the sensational route. And what then that meant is that they had to keep doing crazier and crazier things to keep their, their audience engaged. And you'll see that at some point, one of the Paul brothers, you know, was... was um, was uh, being castigated on social media because he was doing a vlog and he happened to walk into this forest that was called Suicide Forest and he actually filmed a, a, a dead body in 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 the process oh, of his vlog wow. and and not only did he film it then published it on social media so he did get the views that he wanted um the other brother was doing crazy things had to be kicked out of the neighborhood so again the problem going down the sensational route is you have to keep being more and more sensational um to be able to keep your audience so I think it's really important to try and identify what you're going to define as what's going to make your content worthy of remark. And then hopefully you pick a route that's sustainable and that that, that doesn't get to compromise your 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 values and everything and you end up in, in a good space. Right. Yeah, maybe to think about the statement of no press is bad press. Maybe there is some bad press. <laughs> yeah. Yes, yes. Um, okay, so next. Uh, so community engagement can amplify the impact of storytelling. 
how do you foster a sense of community among your audience and encourage them to share their stories too? Um, so for this, again, I think it would start with what your content strategy is. Um, once you've built a bit of a following, how do you engage them? And there are many tools on these different um, platforms that allow you to do that, from polls to Q&As. I think um, Just Ivy's done a really good job with her Q&A, with what she does on, on Money Mondays, um, which is essentially getting people to send um, um, respond to her questions and then sort of repost that. Um, so that works really, really well. Um, again, like I've said, you can use polls, you can use um, uh, what else? Um, there's all these Q&A tools and then there's the copywriting element of your captions, you know. Um, how do you how do you write your captions? What are you telling people? Is there a call to action in your captions? And I've also noticed that there's a big difference when you have a specific call to action in your captions and when you don't with regard to audience engagement. Um, and then how do you create a community for them? How do you, because again, if you're looking at um, social media, you're interacting and engaging with your audience at arm's length to some extent. So how do you create a space and an environment that allows you to meet with them a little bit more? So you can look at whether it's physical events, you can look at, um, you have the live feeds. And of course, even now places like TikTok, you can be able to get money from, from, from um, live feeds. I don't know if they're paying content creators in Kenya yet, but you know, um, there's lives and you can use those to be able to create um, um, communities with your, with, your, with, your, with your audience. I think it basically boils back down to how do you use the tools on these different platforms to make your audience feel like um, they can relate to you a little bit more and not at arm's length. Fantastic answer. Great, um, so we'll jump to the next question. Moving on to distribution, social media is a powerful platform for sharing content. What mm -hmm. strategies do you recommend for effectively distributing digital stories across various social media channels? Okay, um, again, this really boils back down to, to the audience, the people that you're, you're trying to reach, because at the end of the day, that's who is most important. That's who you're trying to reach. That's who you're trying to talk to. So the way that they consume, the way that they listen to content, the way that they watch content is where you really ought to be paying most attention. So if you're dealing with an audience that's higher, that's more affluent, and um, for example, uh, podcasts, you know, they listen to podcasts on the way to work and things like that. Those are their mannerisms and understanding their behaviors. Then yeah, doing a podcast or getting creating audio content would work really well. But if you're dealing with a much younger audience with a lower attention span and things like that, then, you know, like a TikTok video or TikTok um, reel, you know, 30 second reel works well. If you're dealing with probably like a mid 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 level sort of audience and, you know, they have sort of a little bit of time and look at social media on their breaks, then maybe... Um, Instagram is the way to go. If you're looking at someone who who is a little more who who looks for a little more um, intellectual stimulation on on the digital space, then maybe Twitter is the place to find them. Uh, you know whether it's going to be via Twitter Spaces or just um, Twitter threads and things like that. So it's really for me about understanding. Um, what your audience really wants, where they are already, because you need to go and meet them where they are, and then being able to create and craft content that works well. I'd also like to say that nothing works 100% on the first try. It really is about testing, iterating, and then you'd be able to find the perfect way to be able to reach and talk to whomever it is that you want to talk to. There's no one, you know, if if if, if you swing once and you get it right and on, on a home run on the first try, then you're very lucky. And I guess the the, all the stars have aligned, but many times it's about testing and you'll then find the right answer one along down the road. Yeah. Absolutely agreed. Great. Um, so next question is lastly, measuring the impact of digital storytelling in essential is essential for refining strategies. What metrics should content creators focus on to gauge the success of their stories and how can they iterate based on these insights? Yeah. Uh, so on the tools, I mean, on the Instagram, on the, on the social media platforms, there are very, very many tools that, um, if you're registered as a business account, they give you, you know, insights and it moves from likes, shares, comments. Um, if you're working with newsletters, you'll see things like click through rates. Um, you'll see, you know, for audience understanding, you'll see stuff like demographics and, um, and, um, you know, you'll be able to understand your engagement behavior. If you're on YouTube, you'll be able to see how much time people are spending watching your, your video, like what's the average amount, at what point are people dropping off? Um, so there's lots of different tools, I think, and lots of different um, pieces of information that you get on these multi on these different platforms that you use. So I'd say for me there, it's about understanding what the data actually means. 
um, um, and again, goes back to testing and iterating. So if you then see, so let's say, for example, you, you, you have a video and it's 20 minutes long and they tell you, yeah, the average person watched for 11 minutes and then dropped off, or this is the point at which they dropped off. You know, it, it's about going and looking and saying, okay, fine. What's the most watched part of this video? Try and figure out what you are specifically talking about at that particular point in time. Um, understand that and then also look at the length of video over a particular period in time. So if you use, for example, like a month to be able to key data, a database, you can then find the most interesting thing, the, the things that the audience found most interesting about the content you produced over that month, or, you know, write that down, look at what average um, time they spent in watching that content, find what the most um, important or what the most important place that they were watching is, and then use that data to create an insight. So now have a video that's not maybe 20 minutes long, but that's 11 minutes long. See how the audience responds to that. Maybe if 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 they if they engage more and they watch ninety percent of the video, then you have success and you know that this is the way that um, you ought to go. If they watch even less, then you know you can go back to the old model or even test the other way. So, I think it's about also being able to be, being willing to take risks, um, being willing to take risks, trying to understand your data, looking at what times and and just using that data to the to the to the best of your advantage. Whether it's watch times, whether it's different kinds of content and just yeah taking note and then of course not using too small of a sample size so it's not about taking like one or two videos and being like yeah this is the data that i'm going to use because that's not going to be enough of a sample size but take yeah. it over a month or two and then test it iterate and see what happens great okay so in terms of upskilling and continuous learning um storytelling tends to evolve rapidly how can mm -hmm. creators stay ahead of the curve and adapt their strategies yeah. to align with changing audience behaviors and preferences? Um, so what, what I'd say here in terms of sort of um, um, getting ahead of, 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 of the trend, so to speak, I think it's, up, yeah, like you've said, upskilling is really important. I mentioned earlier stuff to do with AI. So right now, if you're in the digital content creation space and you're not dabbling in some sort of AI to try and help um, um, your content creation process, then yeah, you're probably already um, a little behind. Because now, for example, I know that there's podcast editing tools that, you know, are AI, AI generated and essentially help you do that. Um, I know a lot of people right now who craft their, their captions and their copyright and they use chat GPT for that. So yeah. I think one is about understanding, um, understanding how these tools work and learning. And I think a really important thing is, first of all, with chat GPT, I know that there's this quote that's been going around that says, you won't be replaced by chat GPT, but you'll be replaced by someone who knows how to use chat GPT or AI for that example, for that matter. So being able to understand how artificial intelligence or any new tool that is coming up will help you understand um, your work. Two is being able to learn, even if, even if, even if it's just for the purpose of understanding how a particular platform works or how a particular distribution model works, just learn and understand and read and get that insight because it will help. I think also peer-to-peer -peer learning is important. I don't think it happens enough. Just being able to share ideas with people also e equivalent in this space and just finding out what's working for them, what's not working for them, what are they finding difficult, what can you learn from the process, and then also documenting the process, documenting what you're doing in year one against year two against year three and and finding and, and then having actual goals and actual objectives that you're working to because I think a lot of times content creators don't have specific things that they're working to again like I said a lot of them are, are, are creatives and creatives at heart just you know sort of just do things and they do stuff and don't really think too much about the strategic element into it but have specific goals you know set a target to set a revenue target set a growth target set an audience target um, when you're starting the year and actually actively work towards that target and then try and be a better content creator and what I mean by that is deliberately be a better content creator the writers usually say the only way you can get better at writing is by writing so you just have to keep you just have to keep writing there's really nothing else that you can do and I'd, I'd, I'd say the same thing with content creation you just have to keep creating content and you just have to try and you, you know that's the way that you'll sort of get better at it so having specific growth targets having specific objectives and then working towards that with consistency and discipline and I think you should be able to rise above it when there's a new trend or a new thing that comes up understand it if at the very least if you don't want to use it at least understand it know how it works and then know if it works for you or not fantastic answer um david and jerry says learning a lot here great that was the main point so happy to hear that um 
Second question is in the rapid evolving landscape of content creation and digital storytelling, how important is continuous learning and upskilling for creators and marketers? Oh, crucial, um, crucial, absolutely crucial. Like I've just mentioned, it's 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 absolutely crucial. If 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 you don't pick up if you don't pick up these new skills, um, you you you'll be not only overtaken over over, over time, but you will become irrelevant. And when you think about um, when you think about this is um, what do you call it in 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 when I played rugby, there was this phrase that that would say, you know, there's someone younger who's coming who's going to be faster, stronger, bigger, and better. And the truth of the matter is, um, they they really are the people who are. Um, 19, 20 now, the people who are growing up with these tools are going to be so much better at this if 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 you don't at least indulge and try and understand these spaces and they'll be able to do things that you wouldn't even be dream of doing. Right now, of course, in this age that we're living in with the Instagrams and the cup cards and the TikToks, we're already doing things that people 10, 15 years ago couldn't think about and couldn't believe that they were doing. And those people who didn't transition are now struggling to be able to adapt. And I think, yeah, part of the problem in, in, in the, the curse of our, you know, the technology is that it's developing so quickly. It's developing so quickly that um, just trying to keep up and trying to keep abreast is, is a lot of, it's, first of all, it's a lot, but in all honesty, you need to. There's no other way that you're going to be able to keep a competitive advantage against someone else in the space of younger people who are coming up. So it's important. And that's what I'm saying. If you're not dabbling in some sort of understanding of AI, then, then you know, it's, it's problematic. If you're not setting, I, I know another thing that content creators don't do is set clear objectives around learning and understanding new things. And what I mean by that is, are you actively working at being a better editor? Are you actively working at being a better storyteller? And and how you do some of these things is engage with people in different spaces. So you you know in terms of figuring out how different people tell stories, hang out with a playwright, hang out with a copywriter, hang out with with someone who tells a story in a totally different way with a musician. Because at the end of the day, even with music, it's about telling a story. Find out how they work. What can you learn from them? What can you pick up? And what can you try and bring into your space that would be innovative? So that's again is what I'd say that it, it's it's extremely important and crucial. And if you're not picking those up if we're not learning then then there's a problem oh i completely agree i think it's impartial to stay abreast um a good example is when we were using um blueberries and you know a lot of people were like i'll never use a smartphone i yeah. i love the keys on my phone and now it's what everyone is using so yeah, yeah. okay cool next question is um Many content creators might feel overwhelmed by the prospect of learning new skills while managing their current workload. What strategies can they use to incorporate upskilling into their routines effectively? Right. Um, so the first thing that I'd say, again, in my experience as content creators, is first of all, I don't think enough content creators, at least in 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 the people that I've experienced, um, create enough content or work hard enough. I think there's the people in the comedic space, and I think they do. I think if you look at um people like Jogosh or Terrence or people like that who are literally on a daily basis just creating content. Um, I think those guys work really hard. Um, if you think about, if I'm to sort of step aside from content creation, if, I, if I'm to talk about someone like Michael Jackson, by the time Michael Jackson passed on, I think they said that he had a thousand, up to a thousand unreleased songs that the public had never heard. Um, and I'd say for me, it would be for people to try and adopt that kind of work ethic. If you're creative, and we've seen all your work, then I think there's a problem. And many times content creators create for just that. It's either for that day or that week, but they never, we never really have like a body of work and you're never really just working hard at it enough. For me, my my um, change or sort of my true understanding of this philosophy was I was having a conversation with uh, um, the Saudi soul manager, I think about two years ago, and we we're just discussing the workflows and how difficult it is to sort of work in this creative industry. And so they explained to me just how dedicated um, Saudi soul work to this craft. And one decision that they made for themselves 10 years ago was that this was going to be their nine to five that they were going to create music. Like that is what they're going to do. So on a nine to five basis, on a daily basis, that is what they specialize in and make sure that they're doing that. I don't think that happens enough with content creation because you will create a video for two hours. And if you get to a point, let's say you get to 100, 150,000 followers. Yeah, you easily could be generating what 150,000, maybe to 200,000 a month on a good on a, on, on a good month without having to do quote unquote too much because you'll create two or three videos, do a couple of images and you'll be fine. 
but too many people are okay with that fine in the sense that you're not really pushing yourself in the content creation space like how are you actually becoming a better content creator how are you actually um working to to you know towards this thing so i'd say that it's important, but one, I don't think that um, a lot of the content creators work hard enough in that space. So I do. So in that sense, I don't think that their workload is is um, is that intense that they would be unable to upskill. But if your workload then is that intense that you'd be able to upskill, then I'd say yeah, it goes back down to discipline and scheduling. Because the other thing that um, really becomes a big problem in the content creation space because of how emotionally draining it can be is your mental your mental game um a lot of people go through you know because there's lots of ups and downs that sort of come and go so you'd have to be able to temper your time online your your, your comments and the engagements that you're taking in from your from the public and how do you temper that so that you can keep your sanity you know so that your mental sort of you know um, um state doesn't sort of weather off too far away and how do you schedule um a specific time in a day or a week and say i'm going to dedicate and make sure i do at least two hours because i mean two hours would be 30 30 minutes over four days and i'm sure anyone can do that so it goes back down to scheduling in terms of the resources of where to find some of these tools i mean uh, on, on google you google you know free courses on editing free courses on this there's udemy there's so many different places you can find um content yeah and and content skills i agree as they say uh, Google is your friend. So yeah. these days it's so much easier to find what you're looking for with just a little bit of research and some consistency in the time you put to learn it. Okay, great. So we'll go to the next question. Um, with numerous resources available for upskilling, how can creators discern high quality sources that, are genu that genuinely enhance their skills? Um, I think some things is of course working with accredited platforms. Um, you know, like Udemy or um, Coursera or, you know, any just places where, you know, you actually have accredited um, um, individuals working with people who do have a body of work and someone who can say that, yes, I've actually done this and this is how I've done it. Because I've also known a number of people in the content creation space who have either paid for um, workshops and things like that, but um, don't really end up getting too much out of it because the person who was facilitating or the person who was trying to teach or talk about whatever it is didn't really have a, gra a full grasp on whatever it is they wanted to discuss. So ensuring that the person that you're working with um, is a is is a credible credible resource, whether it's a platform, whether it's a human being, I think that's one element that's really important. Um, and then, of course, there's also the element of getting reviews from friends. Of course, um, if your friends or your colleagues or co-workers in this space have done certain courses, just getting getting their, 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 their feedback, then trying to understand what a particular curriculum may be. Um, if you're doing a, a course, trying to, you know, ask the person or read through the course and try and find what are the units that are being talked about will these be important for me and then again boils back down to what do you want to achieve um because if 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 i want to be a better editor then that's really where i ought to be focusing on rather than the copywriting element of things so trying to figure out what are your skill set what is it that you need to enhance what it is what is it that you need to you know capitalize better what is it what is it that you need to improve so even breaking down the the relevant skills that make you a content creator from the story I'm losing you there Barack, a little bit Oh, sorry, can you um, hear me now? The network might be a bit slow. Oh, can you hear me now? Yes, I can hear you now. Yeah. So I was saying, even if you 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 look at the different qualities that make up a content creator, from the ideation to the storyboarding to the filming to the editing to the distribution, and if you look at those seven elements and look at say how do you get better at each of these seven? And what are the ones that you need to get better at? And then finding relevant um, courses that work well for, for those. Oh, have I disappeared again? A little bit at the end, um, but yeah. I think there's okay. a general yeah. understanding. Yeah, okay. Okay, cool. All right, um, last question on this upskilling and continuous learning as a bit is, uh, could you share a personal experience or a success story where upskilling played a, a pivotal role in amplifying a creator or a marketer's career in the content industry? A personal experience where upskilling has helped, has helped me um, become a better, 
<laughs> a better person in the in, in the field. Okay. Um, yes, I can share one. I mean, I think it would be the 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 the, the biggest one, really. So, like I mentioned, I I sort of started in the law space. That that's that's what my degree is in. Uh, my first degree was in rather. And I then, my understanding of the entertainment world or the sports management world was really from reading multiple articles and things online and things like that. And I then made the conscious decision to sort of understand it better. And so what I then went to do was do my master's in sports management. And through that, I was able to understand the relevant structures that need to go into the um, into a content creation space to create an environment that can be monetized, an environment that... Um, essentially would work as a business. So I went and I studied and I understood the skills. I understood the basic um, function of how to make that work. And then I came and I applied and now I have now applied that in, in, in my everyday work instead of trying to set up those different structures. So my response to that would be, yes, I mean, my own personal experience was actually going in and studying the 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 craft, so to speak, and coming in and, and um, applying that. Yeah. Fantastic. Well, I mean, I think we come to the end of our webinar. Um, it's been so amazing. So many interesting things to learn from, you know, the uniqueness and authenticity of the content you create to the different problems we go through. And Barak has been able to answer a lot of those. Um, please feel free to check out our uh, Instagram pages of ADMI and Accelerated, which is Join Accelerated, I believe. And um, please pose more questions. We're there for the discourse. Uh, Barak, I'd, I'd leave the podium to you to give any closing remarks and any thoughts and um, opinions that you have. Oh, uh, I don't know that I have I have um, uh, anything other than, um, I guess if, if, if you're in content creation, just um, remember for me, key factors are discipline, um, have discipline, have a key objective, have something that you're actually working towards, um, work on continuous improvement, not necessarily in the big, big um, jumps, but just the small, small, small increments. And if you're sort of um, trying to figure out, you know, when the money will come, how it will come. Yeah, it is a bit of a journey, but it does, it does come at the end of the day. And just to have yourself ready for that, that, that would be my parting shot. Yeah. Fantastic. Barak, thank you so, so much for being our keynote speaker today. We're really excited. Um, tomorrow we'll have also another webinar. We'll share on our socials the timing and topic. Please join us and share your opinions and questions. Thank so, you, everyone, for coming. Sorry. Yes, please. Yes, someone who's asked about an art, the article I was posting, I actually have posted it. Um, okay. Yeah, I posted it at 10.54. Um, yeah, let me see if I can post it again. This was the the red um, a collaboration with iPhone and the NGO, sort of the NGO geospace, yeah. Right. Oh, the Please second one, I'm actually, that, yes. yes, the second one I'm supposed to share. Let me share that as well. This is the Same. one on the... Same. This is the one on the... Yeah, so please, everyone who's attending, kindly, um, if you're interested, yeah. click on and, and check out what Barak was sharing. Yeah. Barak, I'd also ask you maybe to share your socials or any new project you're doing. Um, and yeah, anything you want your listeners to know about you and your your plans for the future. Uh, my my socials, maybe let me share my, my email address. Yeah, you can share them on the chat. I believe, yeah. Um, I don't know. Uh, my my oh my my links aren't going to everyone. My links are going to, to the host and panelists. Um, sorry, that was my bad. Let me. I think we can also yeah okay. Uh, if you can't, if you're not able to do that there, uh, for our attendees, we can post um the information that you need from Barack or us on our socials, and we can move on from there. So yeah. we'll see if Barak is able to share with everyone. If not, we'll still be able to share on our socials, then you can check that out. Okay, We've so. also uh, shared more information about um, the next webinar right here. So for the attendees, kindly check out um, the webinar that we've shared for tomorrow, and we'd be happy to have you joining in. 
otherwise i think uh, uh this was such a fantastic and interesting conversation thank you so much Barak, again and of course to our attendees thank you for coming uh we're looking forward to seeing you for the rest of the virtual open week we're having and the different topics and discussions and speakers that we will have on board thank you everyone bye all right bye thank you